All right. <clears throat> Welcome to episode, I think, seven of the Shader Dev series. Today I'm going to talk about um, the transforms that I mentioned in the previous videos. I'm going to talk about how to actually do those um, in practice in a vertex shader. And one of the applications I can think of where you would want to do a, a transform originated from a vertex shader is animation, so I'm also going to talk about very limited shader animation. And when I talk about <clears throat> animating in a shader, usually I mention or, or I want to bring up the fact that you only want to do simple animations in a shader. The kind of animations that don't, you know, need to interact with things like physics and don't need to depend on the state of um, things in the main program in the game. Those kind of animations, the more complex stuff, should be originated from and computed at least in part uh, in the OpenGL based program or game that's running it. But in cases where you would actually want to do simple animations, it's actually more efficient <clears throat> to do them in the shader because in the shader um, it can run these animations completely independent of anything on the CPU, so they're kind of free from waiting on the CPU to give them information. So, <clears throat> switch things up just for this video. I'm running on the iPad. Um, I just kind of want to show you guys that uh, you can do this stuff on the iPad, do just about everything that you can do with the Mac version of Reto. So, if you don't have a Mac, um, this might be an easier way to operate. I've also, for the sake of not trying to you know, fill up the screen with the on-screen keyboard. I've connected a Bluetooth keyboard to my iPad just for this video. So when, if you're wondering how I'm typing, that that's how. So I got the default shader set up here on my um, test model. And I've got my shader set up, and I'm just going to show you what I have here. Basically what I have is three functions <clears throat> that generate and return for me a rotation matrix a translation matrix, and a scale matrix. The rotation matrix, like I said, is complicated and kind of a mess, but um, you know you can believe that this code does return a matrix that will rotate um, a series of points around an arbitrary axis given a angle in degrees. So I have that. Everything else is the stock shader that comes when you select, you know, new shader. So what I'd like to do here is declare a system uniform and I haven't covered yet called time. And time is passed into your shader automatically as the number of, of frames, which are in sixtieths of a second, that have elapsed since you've entered fly-through mode, which is basically this animation mode that lets you move the camera around. I need to add like a <clears throat> animation play and pause button to Virto, but my hold me over until I did that was basically fly through mode. And what that looks like is you just go to the camera and you hit fly through and you're in fly through mode. And then of course, if I use my two thumbs here, I can move the scene around. As you can see, the model isn't animating yet and that's because I'm just, I'm not using time yet. So I'm going to, I'm going to handle that now. So bring my shader back up. Okay, so time to use time. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do here is inside my main function, of course I have a position that comes in from the input to the shader. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare uh, vec3, vec4. I'm going to declare a vec4 copy of it called post. And I'm going to actually transform that instead of the base position. Now, when I take position, I can transform it using one of these matrix routines and essentially transform the model from its original object space or model space position on the fly. So what that might look like is if I create a mat4 called trans and set that equal to translation matrix and I just say that I want to translate um, 10 units in the x direction and I apply that to posts 
I should see my model move in the x-axis to the right. It moves very slightly, so maybe if I were to take this and move it 100, you can see that it does move. Now what if I was to want to animate this? And that's where things get interesting. Well, if I wanted to, I could do something like 10 times time. And now once I do this, doesn't like, <coughs> GLSL is a very tight, um, strict language. You can't put 10 and expect it to know you want to float. You have to put 10.0. So now when I run through fly through, you can see the models animating. And of course, this is all done entirely in the vertex shader, which is really neat. Um, if I want to do something kind of more interesting, and I want the model to, um, oops, and I want the model to not animate off the screen, but maybe reset every so often, I can do this little trick. So maybe I'll create here DX. keep trying to use my mouse on my trackpad and I keep forgetting I'm on an iPad here. Um, I'm just going to put DX in here. <clears throat> Swear, whenever I start these videos, like my throat goes dry. It's like on cue. All right. Now, if I would like to, say, repeat this animation <clears throat> every so often, what I can do is I can use this special routine called FMOD. And what this does is it does a, a floating point modulo. So basically what, what it can do is it could say every 600, just start over. I think I did this right. I haven't done FMOD in a while. Doesn't seem to like that. It might just be mod. I get my C and GLSL confused quite a bit. Yep, it's just mod. It's FMOD and C. So now let me run this again. There it goes. It starts over every so often. It's an ugly animation, but it at least shows off a concept like this. More interesting would be if I wanted it to wave back and forth, I could use a sine wave. So what this would be is the sine of time. This is in radians, so I need to make this pretty small. I usually do like 0, 0, 1. And then I take the sine and I multiply that by 600. And what this will do is make it wave back and forth or oscillate depending on... I knew I always get my parens screwed up. I don't need this last one. So this is a cool little effect. See how much nicer that is as opposed to it suddenly jarring. And if I were to <coughs> affect the um, period I think that's right. Or multiply in the time domain. Um, make it go quicker by just removing one of those zeros. So now instead of multiplying time by 0.01, I'm multiplying it by 0.1. And of course, it'll oscillate much quicker. So we can take this and expand upon it. Translation's neat, but what if I wanted to pulsate the scale? Well, this will actually probably make the thing look really cool. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take dx, and I'm basically just going to call this scale now. And a 600 is way too drastic for a scale. So what I actually would probably rather have this do is basically use 1.0 as a base scale, and then have it go between negative 0.1 and positive 0.1. And now instead of using a translation matrix, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a scale matrix. And I'm just going to have every all three <coughs> XYZ scales use that scale component. And I'm going to now transform by the scale matrix. Now when I run this, it pulsates. That's really cool looking. So imagine if you had like I don't know, like an alien egg or something in a game and you wanted to make it look like it was about to hatch, you could do something crazy like that. And the cool part is you're basically doing game development entirely from your 3D studio. Um, you know, you could just kind of insert this shader code and, um, 
you know, assuming it's it's using the right uniform names in any other production system, and you have a really neat shader that you just kind of created your effect, you know, straight up in shader code. Um, rotation, you know, is uh, also an interesting concept. So suppose I wanted to make this thing rotate while it was pulsating. I'm going to compose the two transformations into one. Uh, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to not apply post until it's ready. And I'm going to create a mat for called final, just like in my slides. And I'm going to initially just set that equal to scale mat. This isn't going to make a difference yet. All right, let me make sure that still builds. It does. I need to do more testing in Virto Studio with the Bluetooth keyboard plugged in. This is the first time I've done this. I'm surprised it hasn't messed up. Um, anyway, so we've got our scale. Now we're going to rotate. Since scale does not affect the origin or doesn't translate you away from the origin, um, scale rotation or scale transformations can be done before rotation animations and not mess anything up. I think that's right. Uh, it's the translation that can get you into trouble. So anyway, I'm just going to call this angle, and this is going to be equal to time times 0 0.25. I'm going to make it spin pretty quick. Maybe I'll do 15. Oops. We are not in radians. We are in degrees for this method call. I made sure of that. So time is probably OK. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a mat for called rote mat. I'm going to set that equal to a call to rotation matrix. And if I just Scroll up here, I have axis and degrees. So I'd like to rotate around the y axis, 0, 1, 0. It's the y axis. And I'd like to just pass in angles straight up. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compose the two transforms. And I'm done. I hit y through. And now he's rotating. And he is um, pulsating. Now you'll notice the light doesn't seem to work anymore. As a matter of fact, the shader's programmed right now, so no matter how you look at the surface, the light is only striking it dead on. The default, um, that's what the default shader does. It assumes the light, it's not using the light in Virto, kind of like I showed you in that very first GLSL hands-on video. It's, it's assuming the light's only shining right on the surface. Why is that not working when I animate? And that's because I'm only transforming the posts. I'm using the normal, as it came in um, from the input up here, which is not correct if I want lighting to still work. So what I can do here is I can take the same path of code that uh, I did with post. So I can create a vec4 normal. I can set that equal to normal up here. I bet that comes in as a vec3. So remember, this is where things get different between uh, vertice or yeah, vertexes, vertices, and normals. Um, I need the last component here to not be 1, as it was for the position, but 0. Um, that's important because when I transform this, it, it's not going to make too much sense here, but if I was translating, it would screw the normal up. But it won't if I set the last component to 0. Now all I need to do is take normal. It's an object space transform, so I'd like to do it before the normal matrix is applied, just like I'm doing the... Uh, transformation of position before the model view projection is being applied. And just to recap, the normal matrix does the exact same thing as model view projection matrix with the special exception that it does not screw up um, the normal when non-uniform scales are applied. It makes sure that the normal still works. Otherwise you could probably just do the same transform. It's just a common thing in shader land to use a separate normal matrix to transform the normal. Anyway, um, I digress. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set normal. I think I screwed something up here. I did. Uh, I can't name this normal because I already have a normal. I'll just do norm. Oh god, if I hit eject on the keyboard, the old school iOS keyboard comes up. It just happens to be right next to the backspace key, which is kind of funny if you ask me. Norm equals the same exact thing. Now I transform, oh shit, if I do the wrong thing, problems will happen. Now I transform normal. <laughs> there was an error and I didn't see it. Let me fix that. It's got some kind of problem. Oh, I know what the problem is. Um, it expects this to be an XYZ, which is fine. Just swizzle there. Now the lighting should hold up. 
even though it pulsates. And it does. So that's a cool little animation example. Um, so to show you that you can do more things with time besides this, we're just going to shove this over here and we're going to add essentially a piece of terrain. Um, I've, I don't know what kind of images I have, so I'd rather not show you guys my image library while recording. So we're just going to use random to start out with. So here's some terrain. I always like to smooth it out when I um, add some. So there's some basic terrain. It's not that nice looking, but whatever. You can generate terrain from an image too, and it'll look a little more presentable. So, suppose I want this to not be terrain anymore, but maybe be some kind of really like cheap ocean effect. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new shader for this. Now, of course, some of my lighting went away, but if I just go to my template loader and I load full to start with, I got the full lighting that uses the first light, which is what I want here. So that's all crazy stuff being done in the fragment shader. It's basically the phone model, again, with some special extra caveats for uh, double-sided lighting. Or maybe not, I'm not sure. Um, but the vertex shader still remains pretty simple. So, what I'd like to do here is something kind of interesting. Well, there's a couple things, and I haven't really covered this too much yet, um, and I don't... I'm going to get into this next video, but there are texture coordinates in UV space that are applied to every single point on the surface, and they're basically a 2D way to tell me where I am in this grid of the sea of vertices here, which is a lot. So I'd like to get that information and pass that into my vertex shader, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm basically going to set a texture for this, any old texture will do, because I'm not actually going to use it, but it'll turn on the texture coordinates, which I need. Now, when I pull up my shader, I'm going to use these texture coordinates, which are my UVs. It's already been defined here as tech chord zero, and that has two components, X, Y, or S and T, which tell me basically where I am along the, um, the axes going across uh, and, and in both directions of this. Another way to look at it is if I pull up the tech chord editor, this is the space that the um, that the uh, UV coordinates are defined in. I will explain UV and texture mapping for actual texture mapping in the next video. But for now, what I'd like to do is basically oscillate individual vertices up and down independently of one another. So what I'm going to do is the same old post copy here, back four post equals position, and that's the one I'm going to use down here. Make sure it still builds. And now, translation is one of those things where you don't have to use a matrix to do if it's simple, and that's what I plan on doing here. Basically, I'm going to say post.y equals position.y plus some sine wave of time, which I haven't declared yet. Time is set for me by Virto Studio, as I've mentioned. I also think I mentioned that as long as you use high P, medium P, and low P when necessary, um, shaders that you write on the Mac, if you save them in a scene document and open them on the iPad version of Virto, they'll run all the same. So the shader code I'm writing here will run on Mac and vice versa, assuming you don't do anything that's desktop only. Um, like OpenGL only, that won't run on OpenGL, yes. Um, anyway, I'd like this, this might be enough. Oh, no, 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 it won't. What's going to happen here is I've done the same effect to everything, so it's just going to oscillate the whole ocean up and down at once. And that's going to look pretty bad. Um, as you can see also, the effect is not nearly pronounced enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the amplitude of the waviness just by multiplying this sign by something higher up, probably like 25. Point zero, shut up. Okay. That's too much. 
and the, t the period, I guess, is too long as well. So um, that can be solved by upping this by 10, and this can be solved by making this go down to like 10. Now there's something I'd like to do here, and I'd like to use the U and V to affect the period, or phase shift this. And the way I plan on doing that is basically I'm going to take say tech chord 0 dot s plus. This is going to change things quite a bit here and check this out. Fly through. See what I've done? Now the um, the points move up and down but not all at once. So I'm going to do that but I'm going to essentially affect the period by a lot more by dividing this or multiplying this by 0.1. I think I that was wrong. Maybe I need to multiply it by a higher number. A lot of trial and error involved with game development. Um, sometimes it's better to just trial and error things without thinking too much. You'll burn out your freaking brain. 0.0. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Check that out. I love this kind of stuff. This is like what makes me really like being a game programmer. So now if I want to use T and do it in the other dimension or the other axis, uh, what I'd like to do is use a cosine. So what I'm going to do here is basically um, add again to post.y, really add another term to this, plus um, cosine tech chord t 10 plus time. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think this is the right way to do this. I use tech chord 0 in case the time where I ever add support for more than one set of tech chords in Virto. This is going to look insane. Get ready. There we have it. That is a ocean effect. Now of course it looks stupid because I, I've set the oscillation to be uh, way too much. So I'm just going to down the amplitude here and that should, that should be enough for this to not look so bad. And what I'd actually love to do is parameterize the amplitude as something I can pass in as a shader argument. So what I'm going to do is just call this amplitude and that was 10 but now everywhere I see 10. And I could really parameterize all this if I wanted to make this something I could ship with a game. Um, and pass to somebody who doesn't know shader programming but knows how to do 3D modeling. I could just give this to my artist and my artist could just go right here and not have to worry about this and just key in the value, which is basically what you want to do when you're developing a production shader. Uh, 2.5. 2.5 is just a very slight effect, but if you look at it from the side, it looks really cool. Um, I'm excited. We're happy about uh, my animations, and that is saved with my scene. I mean, if I load this up on the Mac, all right, so I got AirDrop going. I'm receiving my Virto file from my iPad, and I'm going to open it up, and we're going to see what happens. I would laugh if it crashed. Uh, I'm just going to close that. It's one of my other scenes for a game I'm working on. So there's my scene, and if I go to View, fly through mode or more easily control command F. There it is, it's my animations. I produced this file on an iPad and now I'm running it on a desktop. So there you have it guys, that's basic animation and shaders. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. New episode will come someday. Goodbye.